Let's get rolling. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Today is September 29th, 2022, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food Project, founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every Thursday morning, Natalie, along with Jean Lawler, Sara Agamiri, and I, bring you another cutting edge webinar of interest to mediators, arbitrators, lawyers, really anybody who negotiates and communicates as part of making a living and their daily activities. As everyone should know by now, let me remind you, there's no charge for these great programs. Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank if you like what you see. And so far, our audiences have been so very generous contributing in honor of our great speakers. One of my favorite parts of the webinar each week is when we announce the running total of just how much people have contributed to fight food insecurity. Jean, would you do the honors, please? Absolutely, thank you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the totals of which we know, I know there's more, uh, 316,000, 435 and 45 cents. That's well over 3 million meals. So thank you all so much. That, thank you, Jean, and thank you so much to all of our great speakers and all of the wonderful people in our audience who've contributed in honor of those great speakers. And we're continuing with that today with our friend Hesha Abrams. Hesha has over 30 years of uh, experience solving conflicts and difficult problems. She comes to us as a world-renowned mediator, negotiator, and author. As an expert in conflict and pragmatic solutions, Hesha implements innovative approaches and thought-provoking solutions that obtain favorable outcomes for even the most complex conflicts. Hesha's popular new book, Holding the Calm, shares her secrets of how to read a situation to solve problems, eliminate conflict, and restore harmony. You can learn those secrets and inspiring stories by reading her book, Holding the Calm. And Hesha, we're delighted to have you today to let us in on a few of those secrets as well. So please first tell us a bit about the food bank to which you would like people to contribute if they're in a position to do so. And then tell us how to hold the calm our friend Hesha Abrams, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Jeff, I appreciate that. And to make matters even a little more intense and what a wonderful organization this is, like, you know, we'll work for food is fantastic. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm in a hotel room evacuating from the storm in Florida and the storm hit dead center my house, right where we are. And I have no idea, we have no power, we have no water. Um, so my husband and I left at 5.30 in the morning and drove north to Orlando in a hotel to just escape and then be able to get back quickly enough because I hope my roof didn't get ripped off. And apparently there was a hotel, excuse me, a hospital in Port Charlotte, just south of us, that literally the entire roof ripped off and the ICU was on the top floor. So you had people in the ICU looking up and there's no roof, but they had a generator that had power. So there's a high level of misery in Florida right now. And so I would ask, there's something called the All Faiths Food Bank in Sarasota, Florida. And uh, they are gonna, they're fantastic. I've done some work with them before and they're gonna be busy right now. You know, there's, it's just, uh, the, the roads are flooded, emergency vehicles can't get through. I'm on sort of, you know, that next door, you know, website. And I just saw this morning, some woman said, my husband just fell, he's slurring his speech and I can't get an ambulance to get here. It's like, that's, this is, you know, it's real life and real people doing stuff. So thank all of you who are willing to donate uh, to try to, you know, help the misery of others. And so with that, let's go into what we all love and do, right? So I've been a mediator now 35 years, long time. And I'm sure a lot of you are old timers like me. Some of you are more new to it. So wanna, for those of you that are more new, I wanna welcome you to the most wonderful profession in the world. We get to talk to people for a living and solve problems and try to be caring and understanding and non-judgmental and non-difficult for the people that are challenging and difficult. 
And what a wonderful thing. And so I personally am committed to my own personal growth. I'm constantly reading books on neuroscience. I'm constantly attending workshops and uh, groups and learning more and more. And I am 63 years old and I've been doing this 35 years. I figure by the time I'm 70, I might actually be good at it. So I say that to you because after every single case, I do a forensic on myself. How could I have been better? How could I have seen that quicker? What did I miss? How else could I handle that? And I think that by doing that, that's why I'm not burnt out. I know a lot of media, sort of my contemporaries that have been doing it a long time, get kind of tired. You get kind of burnt out. And I think that that is the number one antidote so that you don't get burnt out. So it becomes a continual challenge for you. And for those of us that are mediators, you know, I make thousands of speeches. People are attracted to mediation because one, you really care about people or you care about society. And then you want to make things better. And I don't care what you, know, you could do, the DEI, diversity kind of initiatives, those are great. You can do capitalistic expansion, venture capital stuff, the new health and healing stuff. All of that is great. What is the one thing that destroys all good works? NASA, Mars, Elon Musk, any wonderful thing that is trying to happen, what's the one thing that destroys it? Conflict. It is the DNA underneath every single thing in humanity. And do we teach this in schools? No. How do we teach our teenagers? Use your words. Yeah, it doesn't work when the bully is trying to bully you or you can't get heard. Or that's why the suicide rates are so high. That's why we have these young men, literally who have become murderers, running around shooting up places and killing kids for God's sakes. And not to excuse any of that, God forbid, would never excuse that. It's terrible and it's murdering. But if you go backwards, every single one of those young men has been humiliated, uh, embarrassed, belittled. Uh, think about that, that uh, shooter in Uvalde. He shot his grandmother in the face. Tell me about that relationship, right? Now, not to be utopian, because I am not a utopianist. We live in a real world. The world is not filled with rainbows and unicorns. It's filled with narcissists and difficult people and low skill set and amygdalas that go crazy. And we're going to talk a little bit this morning about the neuroscience of conflict and what an amygdala is and how it works and how it literally is hijacks us. Um, but I'm saying that to start with because if we, in our own little tiny world, in our own little tiny orbit, can inject a little bit of kindness or understanding or communication or warmth, we could literally change the trajectory beyond what we can even imagine. It's like a stone into a pond with the ripples that just come out. And I look at that, I don't know if any of you have been paying attention to NASA, had what's called the DART program, where we literally shot, good, I'm seeing some nodding heads, where we shot uh, a small rocket into an asteroid as a test to see, could we move it? Because remember, an asteroid hit the Earth 65 million years ago, and I was when the dinosaurs were there and destroyed all living life. Uh, scientists are kind of worried about that. We're watching asteroids. And so this was a big test could we affect and change that? And it was a rousing success. I mean, I can't even imagine the orbital math that was required to think about how that thing went. And it hit right where they wanted it to hit. And now they're testing how far they were able to move that asteroid. Well, I wanna use that as the same analogy for us, my friends. You have somebody who is undeserving of your attention, who is a narcissist, who is self-righteous, who is arrogant, who is a jerk, who is nasty, who is mean, who is hateful. Choose all of that. And in that moment as a mediator, or as just a real life person in real life life interacting with people, if you have some of these holding the calm skills and you can move the trajectory of that asteroid two or three inches, just that, how might you change the trajectory of that entire person's life and who they might affect? Just that tiny little bit. And so that is something that I'm spending a lot of my own personal time and attention on these days. How can I be more? How can I be kinder when I don't want to be? When the other person doesn't deserve it? 
when they're not entitled to it. And what the beauty is for those of us that are mediators, we get a laboratory to practice it every day or every time we do a case. How marvelous that we get to practice, practice, practice so that when we need it, we've got these tools. All right, so let's hit holding the calm. So the first question, this book, when I first came up with that, and this I can say to all of you as fellow mediators, the first book I wrote, uh, well, I should start with this too, because you'll all, a lot of you know me and you'll laugh. Uh, I've been doing this a long time and I've made thousands of speeches and people are always saying, you got to write a book, you got to write a book. Who has time to write a book? You're working all the time, you're raising kids, you're doing community stuff, there's no time to write a book. Well, two years ago, I had a hysterectomy, which, you know, knock on wood, turned out fine, but I was grounded for six weeks. So I thought, okay, it poured out of me. I mean, it was just easy. It just poured out of me. And I first called it mediation magic because I wrote it for us. You know, we're the, we're the inside scoop here, right? And the publisher said, oh no, this has to be broader. It has to be for everybody. Can you take out the legally stuff and take out the pure mediator stuff and make it more applicable to everyone? It was an amazing experience because it forced me to stretch and pull it back in a much bigger way. And it's had, I mean, uh, amazing response. So it's been really marvelous. And the way we came to holding the calm is he said to me, because I'd called it mediation magic. He said, uh, what do you do? Uh, how, why are you good at what you do? Why does it work? And I you know, used a bunch of words. He goes, no, no, no. <clears throat> why are you good at what you do? And again, I just used a bunch of words. And I'm saying that because I'm going to be asking you all that same question. And he said, do me a favor, go home and write a formula. I said, you can't write a formula. This is, we, we treat everybody different. We interact with everyone. You know, I say all the right mediator stuff, right? He said, just trust me as an exercise, do it. And I sat down. Okay. If I had to make five steps, what do I do? The first thing I do is I hold the calm. You've got to have somebody who's the freaking adult in the room, right? Because if your amygdala has been hijacked, who's the adult? Who's the grown up holding the calm? And uh, my concern was when we named it that, was that it would be too touchy feely. And you know, the people who wanted to design the cover did it in a very Zen kind of touchy feely way. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. This is a book for carnivores. This is a book because the people like us who understand it, this will enhance our skills. But I wanted something for the carnivores who have, like uh, Maslow said, if all you have is a hammer, all you will see are nails. I wanted it for the people that say, I tried one thing and it didn't work and you're a jerk. That's it. We're done. And then now we're off to war. Those of us as mediators, we know that's not the case. We know there's lots of choices and ways to do it. So what I did is I wrote 20 tools in 20 chapters. And each chapter has lots of stories in them. And I give them to you. The Torah, the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, the Dharmashalas in Buddhism, every single spiritual teaching teaches in stories. Why? I can give you information, but if I give you a story, all of a sudden it stays and it holds with you. And one of the techniques I'm gonna teach you later today is called Vux. And I did it on purpose because, you know, when someone's not listening, fuck them. Now you're all going to laugh and no one's going to forget that, are you? So doing those little things in your head so that you remember, we're going to go through some of those things. Anyway, so that's what I did. So let's go to the next one. And uh, I think it goes that way. There we go. So the question is, how do I, what do I do in conflict? How do I help resolve or minimize it? So I'm gonna give you a quick, easy analogy that I, at anything I tell you, take them, use them in your mediation. Say, my friend Hesha told me this, or I heard this story, or however you wanna do it, because it helps people encapsulate the concept you're trying to do rather than give them information. So all conflict, every single one begins with tension. Every single one. That's why we call the book, Resolving Conflict and Diffusing Tension. Now, the tension may be quiet. You may not have seen it because it wasn't diagnosed, but it was 100% there. So what happens when you're cooking and you drop spaghetti sauce on the counter? You wipe it up with a sponge, right? No big deal. What happens if you leave it overnight? You're scraping it off with a spatula. 
What happens if you leave it a couple of months? It becomes old and moldy and gross. That's conflict, my friends. So what we are going to do as professionals is let's wipe it up with the sponge early and easy because we are good diagnosers. We have the ability to see things before they erupt. Why do we have to wait to put a stoplight on that corner until a kid is killed? We all know it's dangerous. Put a stoplight there now. But preventative medicine, preventative actions are not generally how we're wired and it's not how our society is wired. So we in the know can do things preventatively. Okay, I love this quote. Take a sec. Isn't that marvelous? That's what we do as mediators, my friends. I like this one too. Okay, what's holding the calm? Let's go into neuroscience land. So the amygdala are two tiny kidney-shaped little organs deep at the back of the brain above the brainstem. They are the fear and negativity center of the brain. They are the fight, flight, or freeze mechanism of the brain. Is that thing a rope? Is it a stick or is it food? Your brain will decide that in a nanosecond like that, then your prefrontal cor cortex, which is under, under here, under the forehead, then justifies the decision you made. So how many people just, you know, just raise your own hands in your offices where you are, have been involved in a mediation or in real life, and you give people data and information and it doesn't change their minds. <laughs> Isn't that just amazing? Why doesn't data and information change their minds? Because the amygdala has hijacked the brain. And that's why we all have flat foreheads because we smash our heads against the wall so much. So how does it work? Now that we can stick people in MRI machines with little sensors all over them, we're learning a lot about the brain. So what happens is that when the amygdala is hijacked and is, or I should just say activated, forget hijacked, it's just activated. And it's activated like that, my friends. Uh, what happens is you get what's called ocular occlusion and auditory exclusion. Ocular occlusion is your eyes shut down. Uh, auditory exclusion, your ears shut down. So, except for those of you that I think were driving, don't do this. But for everybody else, humor me. Take your hands, put them around your face like this. And now close off your peripheral vision, make it real tight and small. That's the field of vision that somebody sees when their amygdala is hijacked. So giving them more information and more data will not work. They can't see it, they can't hear it. And what's interesting is that when the amygdala is highly activated and you get ocular occlusion and auditory exclusion, guess what? It creates what's called a refractory state that lasts for, bing, 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 20 minutes in everyone. Isn't that interesting? 20, I mean, 18 to 22, but basically 20 minutes in everyone. You cannot talk to someone. You can't logicate with them. You can't rationalize with them. You can't give them data or information. You can't get them to see another point of view. You can't do any of that for 20 minutes. The amygdala has to calm the heck down. So that's why we do holding the calm. Never in the history of calming down has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down, right? Never, yet isn't that what we do? It's just the craziest thing in the world because what happens when the amygdala is hijacked, when the amygdala is activated, it feels powerless. So my theory is that all conflict, every single one, comes down to power. It's either getting it, keeping it, taking it from someone else, preventing someone else from taking it from you. That's literally the DNA beneath all conflict. And I don't know how to handle it. I don't know how to stop you from taking, or I don't know how to make you give. That's the push pull that actually happens. So when the amygdala is feeling powerless, it's in charge. Good stuff is not going to happen when the amygdala is in charge. You're going to run from the saber-toothed tiger or you're going to freeze and be eaten. That's just, that's just all there is. So how do we get the amygdala to calm down? We give it some power. So simply saying, I am holding the calm. I am holding the calm. I am holding the calm. It's a rabbit's foot. It's a talisman. It's a mantra. And it takes 10 seconds. And your amygdala says, oh, someone is driving the bus. Okay, I'm not alone here. I'm not powerless. I'm okay. 
That's what's so absolutely critical about it. That's why I named it that, because if you say it to yourself, first of all, get a hold of yourself, right? That's the most important thing is to get a hold of yourself. Now, with somebody else, we'll talk later, you can say if they know this lexicon and how this works, I'm holding the calm with you. You're not alone. You're not powerless. You've got choices. You've got options. Let me help you. 50% of the poison whoo, drips down. That's what's so absolutely amazing about this. So literally use this thing as a talisman, a mantra, or a rabbit's foot. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm, right? So holding is creating and sustaining the space for the calm. What's not holding the calm? Defensiveness, panic, overreaction, dismissiveness, arguing. Now, I want to make sure to say I do every one of those things, and so do all of you, because when the amygdala is hijacked, you have no choice. I have a whole chapter in the book called The Blame, Defend, Justify, Death Dance, because that's what happened. I blame, you defend, I justify, lather, rinse, repeat, ba-bum, ba-bum, ba-bum. How do you stop that? So we go, and that's a more complicated than to discuss in this training, but that's one of the things that you want to do because when you notice that you are in defensiveness, panic, overreaction, dismissiveness, arguing, you say to yourself, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm. I got choices here. I got options. And what it does is it creates a moat. See, look, I'm trying to see in the, in the picture here. Here's my heart and my feelings and my intensity. When you have these kind of feelings, it's gripped right here, really tight. You can't think you're in that refractory state because your amygdala is activated. You need some space, pull that sucker out. So there's a moat between what you're feeling and how you choose to react. When you choose to react, you're gonna make better choices. It's as simple as that. So this one, a friend of mine actually sent me that, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> and feel free to take that one, screenshot it now if you want to, and uh, take it and enjoy using it with your clients and in your world. Okay, now, my publisher asked me, you know, because you know it's hard to get a book published, right? So you have to really sell the publisher on it. And he said, what's this book about? Why do you want to write this book? And I said, this book is reading glasses. Before people put on a pair of reading glasses, they don't know how bad it was, and they don't know how good it could be. So what I do when I travel, I like to go to indigenous places where there's not a Starbucks, you know? So I travel the world and usually there's tremendous poverty. And I usually bring stuff with me. I bring markers or pens or balls or little books or stuff like that. And then I landed on a really great idea, reading glasses. You can buy them wholesale for two bucks each and they're thin. And I'll buy, I don't know, a couple hundred pairs. And I do all different powers and I line them in my suitcase and then I just give them away. And then I have room in my suitcase for crafts or you know souvenirs or things I wanna buy when I bring back. And what happens is people then, they choose the power they choose the style. I've had kids grab me and drag me over to their grandmother's stall so she too could get to see. I mean, it's amazing. So I can't do real glasses with prescriptions, obviously, but even people who can't see and they can't get prescriptions, now at least they can read or they can see something up close. I've had people cry and I can bring this happiness and joy for two bucks. It's a crazy, right? So that's what I wanted this book to be. I wanted it to be reading glasses for people. You don't know how bad it was or how good it could be until you start playing with some of this stuff. Okay, now I'm gonna take a minute here because I've been talking for 30 minutes. Uh, hopefully you have a piece of paper in front of you or just doing it on your computer. I want you to stop a minute and ask yourself, why are you good at what you do? We're gonna take just a minute, give you a second to think about that and write it down. And if that was hard for you to do, I'm gonna ask you to play with it all day today. Because that 
is really important. One, to validate yourself. Why are you good at what you do? What are the one or two things that you do or that you just are that make you good at what you do? And validate yourself for that. Next is later throughout today, well, because this issue is up for you, where are you not so good? Where could you use some improvement? Where do you want to get better? Because there's a whole chapter in the book that I wrote called Creating Small Winnable Victories. We always think of things big, you know, abortion, baby killing, uh, abortion, get your hands off my body. I mean, big, huge, bifurcated issues, no room for discussion or movement. That's how our brain is also wired. Our brain's not wired for subtlety. We don't think about it that way. But if you train yourself to start thinking that way, you will start to see benefit and value in everybody, even the ones that at first blush sure as heck don't deserve it and are trying to take power from you or harm you or do something you don't want them to do. So when you can look at yourself and say, what's good about me and what am I working on? That helps you see what's good about them and what's good for them and what they're working on. And would you like a quick, easy, simple way to paradigm shift for yourself when you're having to deal with somebody really difficult? Because we all do. We're humans. We're with somebody and think, oh my God, I mean, this person's a Neanderthal or they're evil or they're a narcissist or they're harming people or, 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 or fill in the blank. You are not gonna be effective with them if you think and feel that way. So how do you just shove that to the side? You look at them, here's my little trick. You look at them and you say to yourself, would they pull my kid out of a burning car? If the answer to that is yes, there's something redeeming about them, isn't there? That's what you speak to and you lift that up. You actually help people behave better than they otherwise would because you see that and you lift that up. And 95% of the time, the answer to that question is yes, right? Okay, we're gonna do this. I have a whole chapter in the book on civility matters. And we're gonna do a little bit of this because if you're applying for CLE, this gets you half an hour of CLE credit. So that's why we're gonna talk about it. Um, civility. There was a, a, a whole thing in the book where I cite the studies. There was a study done in England where they were trying to decide, does politeness and civility actually get you anything? Because most of the studies were all the touchy-feely stuff. You know, we work together better in a group. And if we support each other, you know, sort of the game theory thing, and we're all going to be, be okay, that's great. But those that are carnivores, we want to know, does it work as a tool? Does it work? Will I get more of what I want if I have civility or politeness? So they had a long line of people standing in front of a copy machine. And they just basically had, you know, free copies so they could get a bunch of people standing in line. Then they had actors try to cut the line and they used different uh, sentences. So the beginning was long, elaborate. I'm late for work and my, my tire blew and I can't get there and I have, you know, a long thing. And they got about an 80, 85%, sure, cut the line in front of me. Still had 15% that said no, which is interesting. So that was fine. Okay, now what if we shorten it more? Um, please, I really need your help. I need to cut the line. Okay, about 80%. So you don't need all the reasons. Then they cut it down even more. What if it's just, please, I really need to make a copy. May I cut in front of you? Like they, it dropped very little to like 70, 75% still said yes with no reason at all, simply by being polite. So there's a whole study about how they do it. There's also another study where um, you want to call somebody a cold call and you want to ask information from them. And you just start with, uh, uh, you know, or, uh, can I ask how, how we got your information? Can I ask how you knew about us? You get like a 40% response rate to that. But if you talk to the person first, and there's some politeness and discussion. And then afterwards you say, by the way, do you mind if I ask you how you heard of us? Whopping 90% success rate. 
And I think about this because every one of us here has been on web pages, right? You go to a new web page, what's the first stupid thing that pops up? Sign up and you get 10% off. It's irritating and annoying. The first thing you do is click that thing and get out of here. I don't even know if I like you yet. I don't even know if I want to be on your website yet, but they're not using the science. They pop it up right away. If they waited until I was in the screen for a few minutes and did something politely, don't, don't uh, try to bribe me that I'll get 10%. Say, we really value you. You know, you're a sophisticated shopper because you're on this site. You know, you're an aware consumer because you're doing this. Would you like 10% off? Their rate would skyrocket, but you know, no one has called me for consulting on that. <laughs> okay, so what if someone refuses to speak? How do you handle that? So I want to put that in your mind because we're going to deal with that with Vox. Us versus them. Our brains are wired to be Hatfields and McCoys. They just are. We are tribal in our total brain evolution. My family, my tribe, my religion, my. Well, if you're not part of my or me, you're them. And any sense of conflict, it's very easy to go us versus them. So this is a corollary to the politeness and civility matter stuff. There's all kinds of studies that I quote about, they took a, this was in the sixties when you could really you know, do things that were not good for people. They, they were not as regulated as they should have been. So they took a whole group of boys and they just put them in red shirts and blue shirts and had them at this camp and made it an us versus them. The hatred and viciousness that started happening between the us versus them was so bad, it overwhelmed the uh, researchers. It's like, oh my God. And now they're thinking, how do we undo the damage we've done? So what they did is they created a common difficulty that they had to share. So they put all of them in a bus and they had the bus break down in the mud. So all of them had to get out and push the bus and pull together. And all of a sudden, the bonds that had been separated viciously united into a new us. And the them was the boss, or perhaps the adults that were stopping them from doing something. So it's interesting from a neuroscience perspective, this us versus them thing is elastic. It can be broken. It can be re-engaged. So how do we use that as mediators? I mean, you get people for two hours, two days, you know, whatever it is you're doing, right? Uh, I never use the words you when I'm, well, I shouldn't say never, but I try to never use the word you when I'm mediating. I will say us and we, I use plural words all the time. And instead of saying, you know, what will, uh, what will they do? What will John and um, uh, Lucinda do? How are we going to respond to them? How are we going to look at that? Now, that just makes a trigger in the brain that goes friend or foe. I can trust you. I cannot trust you. Now I'm doing that with the other side too. So my neutrality is completely maintained. But when I'm within a group, remember in conflict, the amygdalas are up. So everything becomes narrow, friend or foe. So if I want to trust you, you have to sort of kind of be part of a me and then sort of kind of part of a me on the other side. Now I make sure I say that I'm very clear. They know that I'm neutral and I'm helping everybody. But you have a choice of either help nobody or help everybody, right? So play with that as an idea. Okay. So I have a really wonderful story in there. Um, did you know that the United States has a division of psychological operations? I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Trying to win wars, win conflicts without bullets and bombs. That's pretty interesting. So. Um, and let me just check for a second, stop for just a moment. Uh, Jeff, are there any questions in the chat that we need to address? Because when I'm full screened here, I can't see the chat. Yeah, I think we can go on for now and get the questions at the end, Hesha. Okay, good. So this is a terrific story. So I'll tell you the story. And I have a friend, it's, my, you know, it's a friend of mine who is in charge of it. And the way we became friends, because he's a colonel, in charge of psychological operations for the US military is my husband races airplanes at the US National Championship Air Races. And he races old World War II, they're called warbirds. You know, 100 feet off the ground, 250 miles an hour, kind of racing each other, which, you know, put my heart then into my stomach. But when I married him, you know, we've been married, what, six years now. When I married him, it was like, 
the dude's doing it, right? I just kind of circle the plane and energy and hope that he's okay. So when I first started going, I said, look, I need a job. I'm not going to just stand around for a week. And he goes, fine, you're the pit boss. I said, okay, what's that? And he goes, go figure it out. Well, I show up with about 15 type A personality men running around bumper car egoing into each other. And I went, oh, no, 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 no. This is not how this sucker is going to be run. And I know how to handle people. And I know how to handle big egos and big personalities. So I fused us into a crew and a team using all the normal team building psychological stuff you need to do. And we have this amazing team now. It's been seven years and it's just, we are the envy uh, at the races when they talk about our team and what we do. Well, one of the guys, I mean, these are big, fancy people and they put on dirty coveralls and get oil under their nails and sweaty and hot and digging in the engine and rubbing stuff. And they're happy like eight-year-old boys. It's just kind of amazing. So that's how I became uh, friends with Mark, who actually wrote the forward to my book. And he has lots of stories he cannot tell, you know, and he's even told me a few that I cannot repeat. Uh, but this one is old enough. So he allowed me to tell it and then even to put it in the book. So you want a little, a little preview of it, everybody? Uh, so in Serbia, remember 20 something years ago, Serbia and Croatia and Yugoslavia kind of ripped apart and it was just, they were at each other's throats and it was really bad. And the U.S. went in trying to keep peace and keep it all together, blah, blah. Well, he is in a particular area, and I won't pronounce the names right, So, but they're all in the book. And it's actually in Wikipedia as a, as a battle. I think it's Hill 352 or 356, something like that. So uh, there's a, a radio tower. And that's in the day when a radio tower was really important. I mean, that's how you communicated with everybody. And the U.S. had troops stationed, and they were holding the radio tower. Well, there were some you know, terrorist division, you know, fighter people from Serbia that were spewing a lot of hatred and, you know, that kill the U.S. troops and uh, just a whole lot of vicious bad stuff happening. And so what they did is they got a whole bunch of young men together in the town, got everybody drunk, and then, let's go, let's go, let's go. So it was literally a riot, a horde coming up this hill. So imagine there's this young at the time, I think it was a sergeant, uh, Mark Flinton, who was in charge of psychological operations there dealing with the radio broadcast. And, you know, 10 or 15 young guys with guns. And this horde is coming up the hill trying to kill you. Can you do that would have been a bloodbath, right? They would have shot back. It would have been a massacre. Maybe they would have been killed. They would have ripped the tower down. I mean, it could have been a horrific bloodbath. Well, instead, Mark says to his interpreter, grab a flak jacket and your megaphone and come out with me. He puts on a flak jacket, uh, which is like a bulletproof thing back in the day. And they climb out and climb up as far as he could on this tower, hooks his arm around the metal frame and has the interpreter do that. And he says to the guy, sing Serbian songs. And the interpreter looks like, what? What are you, what are you, what are you talking about? And he goes, trust me. Loud now, Serbian party songs sing. So the guy just started going, hi, yeah, na, 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 yeah, whatever he was doing. And all of a sudden, Mark went, party, we're gonna party, come on, party, we're gonna party, like that. And these guys are drunk anyway. So what happened? They felt the beat, they felt the movement, they started getting into it. And all of a sudden, the guy started dancing and doing all this kind of stuff. How brilliant was that? How brilliant was that? Well, then things calmed down. The leaders are pissed. They come up. Uh, Mark comes down. He negotiates a ceasefire with these guys. So it could have been a bloodbath got resolved by just knowing how people think and how to turn and take advantage of the situation. Let me give you something even simpler. Bananas, 25 cents each. How many would you buy? I don't know. I like bananas. I'll buy a couple. Bananas, four for a dollar, 35% boost in sales. That's stupid, right? You're going to have bananas that are going to rot in the fridge and you're going to throw them away. 35% boost in sales. That's how we are wired and how we think. Okay, so I want to go over the holding the comp toolkit so you can at least see what they are. And then we've got 15 minutes less, left for Q&A. So what I did is rather than make the book just a bunch of just, you know, junk, I tried to make it very tight and usable. I wanted this to be where 
You don't need a degree. You don't need a certificate. You don't need to take an advanced master class. You can have tools that you can use today to make whatever situation you are in better. Whatever you're doing, whether it's your kid's teacher, your neighbor, your idiot brother-in-law, your boss, a case you're working on. I can't tell you. I mean, I work, I, I do big cases now and with big, big, big muckety muck people in $5,000 suits. And at the end of the day, when we're talking, they're asking me stuff about relationships or the kid's teacher or coach or how to handle something difficult. It's very interesting. And I'm going to give you one more you know, lovely little story I heard on uh, NPR Hidden Brain. There was a couch company and the couch company uh, sold bespoke twenty and thirty thousand dollar couches. You pick the piping, you pick the arm, you pick the fabric, you pick the size, all this customized stuff. And a lot of people would go all the way to the point of sale and not complete the sale. Why? The organization was very flummoxed. How do they do this? How do they fix it? What do they do? So um, like most people do, we put more, we only, if you've got a car, you've got gas and brakes, right? You, you, we almost always put gas. We speak louder. We offer more sales. We do, we push marketing. I mean, we do more. Didn't do anything. Finally, someone said, let's put the brakes. Let's stop and see why are people not completing the sale? They hired someone to start interviewing people. The vast, vast, vast majority, number one reason why they didn't complete the sale, drum roll, please. They didn't know what to do with the old couch. Shocking, right? Solution, obvious. When you buy the new one, we take away the old one. Not hard, right? But you didn't know that. So part of what we do as mediators, and honestly, in your real everyday life, is you don't just put gas on it. You don't just immediately act. You step back. You diagnose. You, chapter one of the book is called Speak into the Ears That Are Hearing You. You talk to an introvert differently than you talk to an extrovert. If somebody is a visual, auditory, or kinesthetic learner, you speak to them differently. By customizing that, your effectiveness quadruples. And so let me give you just a quick, easy way. Let's just say the visual, auditory, kinesthetic piece, right? Most of you know what that means. It's sort of like an Apple operating system versus a Microsoft operating system. You either have a Samsung phone or even iPhone. They both work, but they're different operating systems. That is true for us scientifically in our brains. We are either visual learners, we learn by seeing, we're auditory learners, we learn by hearing, or we're kinesthetic learners, we learn by touching. Who's the kid in class that is squirming around all the time? You know, sit still, Jimmy, sit still. No, he should not sit still. He has to move. That's how he learns and gets information. So he's the guy that should be on the board writing. He's the guy that should be taking notes. He's the guy that should be allowed to stand up when he wants to. Anyway, so for us, when you're engaged with somebody, you want to understand how they speak. It's so easy. They will give you clues instantly. So, you know, we all know about venting, right? People are venting, blah, 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 blah. You're just listening to the facts. Okay, fine. But that's 30% of it. You're listening to what they're saying, what they're not saying. You're listening to how they say it. You're listening to whether the words and the body language match. And you're listening to see if it's visual, auditory, kinesthetic. You want an easy way to know how to do it? I see what you're saying. That looks good to me. Verbs are us, everybody. Visual, bing, 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 bing. I hear what you're saying. That sounds right to me. Auditory, bing, 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 bing. Kinesthetic. I feel what you're saying. I get what you're saying. That feels right to me in my gut. Kinesthetic. Bing, 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 bing. So when you talk to them, just change your verbs. If I'm going to do a proposal to somebody, does this look good to you? How does this sound to you? How does this feel to you? Simple. Easy. It automatically, people will say, Hesha just gets me. Why? It's not because I'm some great savant, because I listen to them and I speak in their language. If you've got a bomb in the town square, you know, that Michelin guy or gal waddles out like this to try to fix it, he or she doesn't just start cutting wires. They diagnose, what do I got here? Is it a pressure switch? Is it a 
you know, a chemical reaction. I mean, what do I got? What's happening here? Then you do things. And so often we do what works for us, but you expand your ability to get anything done when you can move outside of who you are, one to the right and one to the left. Now, all of a sudden you have a lot of fluidity, let's say, in being able to interact with so many different kinds of people. And what we tend to do is we think of it as, oh, gender, culture, socioeconomic, you know, those kinds of things, which, yeah, but, you know, I don't think all white men think the same. I don't think all African-American women think the same. I don't think all Hispanic men think the same. I don't think all Jews think the same. I don't think all Catholics think the same. Why would we do that? That's silly. That's, that's like talking to you as like, Jeff, you know, you're in a white shirt. Natalie, you're in a cream shirt. I'm in a black shirt. Why would I, why would I talk to the outside? That's just silly. That's for people who don't know any better. So go deeper. Who is that person? What is important to them? That creates this intense bonding of, you see me, you care about me. And you know how long it takes? Five minutes, guys. How long do you spend scraping that spaghetti sauce off up the next day? Heck, a lot more than wiping it up with a sponge. All right, so we're gonna do a quick just survey of the toolkit and then we're gonna go to some Q&A. All right, number one, you speak into the ears that are hearing you. Two, you clarify generalities like always or never using a percentage. We never do that. Okay, what percentage of the time is that? Oh, it's not 100%. Oh, that's interesting. You listen to what is not said. You allow the magic of silence to work. I have a whole chapter on that that's just absolutely beautiful. High emotions are an opportunity to diagnose. All right, I'm gonna give you one more visual and hopefully you're not eating when I say this to you because um, it's, it, 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 it's a disclaimer, it's a little visual gross. Oh, my tummy hurts. I go into the emergency room bleh, and I throw up. Now, the rest of us would go, oh, gross, that's disgusting, right? Not the ER doc, she looks at it. Does it smell right? Is there pills in there? Is there metal in there? Is it the wrong color? She's diagnosing that sucker. What are high emotions for us? It's vomiting. When somebody vomits, they're just vomiting out all this emotion. What a terrific opportunity to diagnose. But that's because you have created a moat around your own amygdala, around your own emotions, so that you don't feel attacked you can listen and you can hear because you've got some of that space. Now I can diagnose. And I go over trips and techniques and stuff and how to do it. You start a mediation as there's no problems. There's just solutions waiting to be found. I'm a big believer that contracts that have, I mean, I mediate plenty of cases over 30 page contracts, right? So it's not the paper that protects the deal. It's the alignment of the self-interest. If your self-interest and your self-interest are correctly aligned, a deal will hold. Uh, be the grown-up in the room. We've talked a little bit about that, and I've got a bunch of stories about how to do it. I have a particularly beautiful story in there about uh, mountain rams that I have told to people. When I want someone to be the grown-up, I don't say, you need to be the mature one. You need to be the grown No. I tell them this awesome story, and they look at me like... <sighs> Someone's got to do it. I picked you, you know, there's a validation in that. This is interesting. Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky won a Nobel Prize in economics. They were psychologists and they won a Nobel Prize in economics by proving that um, the Adam Smith's imaginary man isn't all about winning, which is what economics had always been. Is it trying to win or is it trying to not lose? Interestingly, for about 85% of us, it's trying to not lose. It's interesting, isn't it? Changes the entire discussion. Seeking creative solutions, how you do that. Using the plural we words, we talked about that. Avoiding the dangers of over-negotiating. You're gonna like that too. Uh, the blame, defend, justify, death spiral. Politeness and civility actually matters and works in a deal. Being curious about people. I have a whole thing where I literally talk about what kind of zoo animal they are. That's fun. When you ask someone for advice, 
It's like giving them a dozen roses and how you do that. I really value your opinion on this. I really wanna know how you think about that. Being culturally and ability sensitive. I have a whole conversation about that. We talked about creating small winnable victories. You ensure all options are exhausted and always, always you hold the calm. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Jeff, because we've got five, six minutes left and people want to go over a little bit. I'm happy to go over a little bit. And we have any questions, have any questions we want to uh, do, and I will stop sharing here. Thank you, Hesha. There's a lot of knowledge and experience, a lot of wisdom in what you have to say. I know everybody benefited. I know I did. And thank you very much. There's one question here. Uh, Going back to the amygdala, are you familiar with psychologist Jonathan Haidt and his elephant slash rider analogy? Indeed. And uh, if yes, what do you think of it as a teaching tool if you are a conflict coach? Maybe you can make sure everybody understands what it is. Sure. He wrote a book called Switch, which is one of my favorite books. And it really is uh, very interesting where the concept is that we think of the amygdala as the small piece. And our prefrontal cortex, the ability to reason and rationalize is the big stuff. He proved scientifically, that ain't the case. The amygdala is the elephant. And the small little Indian guy sitting on the elephant trying to control it is our prefrontal cortex. So it's the elephant that is the amygdala. And it's everything I've really been talking about is that when the elephant is on a rampage or is in charge, you know, you're not, you're in a refractory state. So literally, he wrote that book a long time ago. The science has evolved since then. Um, and so we didn't know about refractory states back then, but we know about them now and how for 20 minutes, you're in a refractory state. So why, why am I giving you data and information? <laughs> There's, it, you won't hear any of it and you're just going to get more and more annoyed. And that's why we've got the VUX idea where I say, you know, VUCM, which is validate, understand, clarify, summarize. And validate is when you can validate someone, you obviously validate them. But let's do an advanced course here. Let's say you can't validate them because I think you're an idiot or I think you're wrong or you're being, you're completely seeing this incorrectly. What you do is you name the emotion. Just by naming the emotion, you calm that amygdala down. Because when the amygdala is loud, it is saying, see me, hear me, pay attention to me, danger, 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 Will Robinson for those of you who know that reference. <laughs> so um, it's an old TV show. So uh, that's why having to have it calm down. And so I look, I would recommend everybody. I don't want to say I've read every book because I'm sure I haven't, but I've read a lot of them. And some I agree with and some I don't based on my own laboratory personal experience. There's some books that are very, they're very academic, written by professors about what it should be or what they want it to be. And I think that would never work. Are you nuts with real people that are ticked off and angry and upset? No, they're not. Don't tell me win-win junk. I don't want to hear any of that. Listen to me, pay attention to me, hear what I want, protect me. That's what they care about. So it's very interesting, but all of you have your own laboratory and I'd encourage you to read a bunch of stuff, you know, watch TED Talks because it makes more in your own head about what I like and what I don't like. Thank you, Hesha. We're sadly out of time. This is such fascinating material. We could go on for a very long time. And I know that uh, people might be interested in getting the book. Natalie has, I hope they are interested in getting the book. Natalie has put a link to the, uh, to the book Thank in the you. chat. Also, the All Faiths Food Bank in Sarasota, Florida. We hope that people they're in a position to contribute, our move to contribute in your honor in light of the situation with the hurricane in Florida right now. It's uh, uh, If people have other questions or want to get in touch with you, could you tell people perhaps what your email is, please? Sure. Uh, what I would suggest is you go into my website, holdingthecom.com. I have videos on there. I have, I mean, I've been, you know, promoting the book like crazy just because I want to get it out there. And I say to you, in case any of you want to write a book, you make 80 cents a book. I mean, this is not like a money-making <laughs> enterprise. And I'm probably making a penny an hour, if, if even that, for the time. But I want to get it out there. I think it will really help people to do that. So on the website, I've got 
all kinds of resources for free. And I created these little one minute holding the calm tips on a particular topic. And so people are loving them. So I, if you can sign up to get them by email and I committed to doing it once a month just because I'm so busy, but when I'm enthused, you know, I'll do a couple a month. And so this way they're just little one minute tips. They're good for you, but they're good to forward to people and say, I know you're having a challenge with this. Maybe this will help that kind of stuff. So holding the calm.com and it has emails and all kinds of good stuff on it. That is great. Hesha, we know that you it's a great personal sacrifice and inconvenience to yourself that you yourself are, had to evacuate your home because of the hurricane in Florida. We hope that you and all the people of Florida are, are, are safe and uh, survive this in, intact. So our, our prayers for everybody in Florida who's affected by the hurricane, including you, thank you for making yourself available even in a motel room where you've had to flee your house. We really appreciate it very much. The All Faiths Food Bank of Sarasota, Florida, holding the C-A-L-M dot C-O-M. And uh, thank you very much. And with that, we are complete. My pleasure, everybody. Bye.